claim the paternity. I, I was a midwife, not the papa. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Where'd that come from? Good afternoon and welcome to the 2023 W. Dallas Herring Lecture. The annual lecture invites community college leaders from across the state and country to speak on urgent and emerging issues, address how to address those issues, and talking about proposing a path forward. My name is A.J. Jager. I am the Executive Director of the Belk Center for Community College Leadership and Research and the W. Dallas Herring Professor of Community College Education right here at NC State University. Thank you to all of you joining us in person. You are joining hundreds of folks from across the country who are engaging with us online. We also have 21 colleges who are participating in watch parties. So our friends gather together to watch Felicia and company have an, an engaging lecture. I'm just going to do a few shout outs, like a drug commercial where it goes quite fast. AB Tech, Blue Ridge, Brunswick, Carteret, Catawba Valley, Central Carolina, Durham Tech, Forsyth Tech, Halifax, Haywood, Isothermal, Lenore, Martin, McDowell Tech, Nash, Piedmont, Stanley, Vance, Granville, and our very own right here in Wake County, Wake Technical Community College. All of those institutions are hosting watch parties today. Incredibly grateful to each of them. So with our watch party viewers, our in-person guests, and those online, we are 1,500 strong, representing 19 states, and visitors from all the way from the UK watching today. No pressure. <laughs> Each year we gather as community college leaders in a spirit of camaraderie. We stand united to our efforts to learn, grow, and build a brighter future for our students and our communities. As part of our responsibility, we must also take an honest look back at the past. We reaffirm our commitment to fostering communities of justice, belonging, and care. I want to acknowledge those who came before us. NC State is a land-grant institution for the people of North Carolina and respectfully acknowledges the lands within and surrounding the Raleigh area as the traditional homelands and gathering places of many indigenous peoples, including eight federally and state recognized tribes. The Koheri, the Eastern Band of Cherokee, the Halawasaponi, the Lumbee, the Meharan, the Okanichi Band of the Saponi Nation, the Saponi, and the Wakamasuan. We share an ongoing responsibility to safeguard these lands and to respect the sovereignty of the tribes and indigenous peoples residing here in North Carolina and across our country. NC State honors all indigenous peoples who have been and continue to be an important and integral part of our history, our culture, our traditions, and our heritage. Another way we strive to take an honest look at the past, guess whose that is? You can turn that off, Karen. <laughs> Don't have to give a dirty look to anyone, but why? <laughs> Another way we strive to look at our past is by acknowledging Dallas Herring's legacy. Though inspiring, it is a complicated one. Humans, though extraordinary, are flawed. 
Dallas Herring, me, you, we are no exception. Herring's first foray into education was humble but profound. In the sixth grade, he bought a pile of books on loan from the state library to his local grocery store. This project not only became Rose Hill's first public library, but a symbol of Herring's lifelong commitment to education in North Carolina. He went on to serve 25 years in the State Board of Education, as well as spearhead the establishment of the North Carolina Community College System. Herring was a man who believed passionately in and worked tirelessly for a comprehensive educational system that would serve all North Carolinians. A man who advocated earnestly for the state's black residents. A man who, for, who fought to increase educational access and champion student success. A man who strived to meet the needs of diverse students while breaking down the barriers that stood in their way. And a man whose vision continues to inspire and propel us as community college leaders and allies across the country. And yet Herring was much more than this. He was a man, in his own words, who grew up believing that segregation was a way of life. Earlier in his career, he was under the assumption that black citizens actually preferred segregation as whites did. This changed, however, in the 1950s when Herring attended a meeting with black residents of Duplin County. Here he listened to the voices of black citizens as they communicated a preference toward integration. And Herring's long-held assumptions began to crumble. All this to say, Herring was a man of remarkable service, but yet not without flaws. Herring did not think of himself as a hero. Rather, a man who possessed a willingness to own up to his mistakes, change his course, a determination to accomplish his goals, and the courage to swim against the current of the day. Listen to the words from 1962. We have only made a beginning and have a long way to go before we can claim success, but we must be willing to get on with the task. We must be willing to move ahead. We must be willing to look at our failures as well as our successes. We must look at them in the light of our original objective, the magnificent goal of total education. We should not let nothing deter us from within or without. This magnificent goal of total education in Herring's mind meant an educational system that was accessible to everyone and designed to develop every citizen to their utmost potential. Guiding that pursuit was Herring's conviction that citizens are humans worthy of equitable opportunity. Looking back on his career, Herring noted how challenging it had been to convince others of the economic need and economic potential of underserved communities. But far more difficult, he said, was convincing others that underserved individuals are human beings with an immense capacity for creative contribution to our society. To Herring, equity was an uphill battle fought with few soldiers by his side. In 1968, he wrote, equity is not easy to achieve and we have not achieved it, but equity must be our universal aim of all the deliberations or they will fail and neither equity nor justice will prevail. In that event, the goal of total education in North Carolina will only be a dream. In 1968, Herring shared these words, to which I believe are as profound today. What I hope we recognize is that there's a lot for us to learn from Herring. He reminds us to stop putting people on pedestals and blacklists, but to see one another how we really are, human beings, who are capable of great mistakes, capable of getting it wrong, capable of having your phone on, <laughs> capable of changing your minds and making extraordinary contributions to our communities. We can hold one another accountable without losing hope, and we can be deeply dissatisfied without being disillusioned. 
Herring wrestled with pressing questions of his day and demonstrated a willingness to change his mind, challenge the status quo, and own up to his faults. Herring encouraged others to be dissatisfied, seeing it as the mark of one's education. Education, he explained, should not, should make us uncomfortable. It should prick our consciousnesses, and it should root us out of the ruts of complacency. More than that, he saw dissatisfaction as one of the keys to a brighter future. Commenting on human progress, he said, it is, I think, the story of all human progress that there have been men and women who are willing to venture great things for the good of mankind. It is never enough for them to be amenable, to be peaceable, to avoid controversy, or to settle for things as they were. I think it was rather that our education taught them to be dissatisfied with things as they were. For them, the world was not good enough. The boundaries of knowledge and beauty were too limited. In a society that is fragmented and divided, we have an opportunity to join hands with imperfect people in pushing the boundaries and carrying Herring's important legacy forward. I know our students and our communities demand it. Today we acknowledge, we celebrate Herring's legacy, as well as the many leaders in this room who have paved the way for the North Carolina community college system. As I hope it will always remind us, it's through many, not one, that community colleges across the country transform the lives of students and thus profoundly impact our communities, our state, and our country. I would like to welcome our NC State Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost Warwick Arden, who is here with us today. He was here with me during our first Daniel Dallas Herring Lecture in 2015. He acknowledges and celebrates the value of community colleges in the state across North Carolina, and this commitment has not wavered. With all the challenges in front of us, there are a few people who think about empowering the opportunity that I want to walk alongside. Provost Arden, you are one of them. With a shared commitment to the accessibility of higher education, Provost Arden has been a wonderful colleague and advocate of the Belk Center. Thank you for being here, and please come to the podium. Thank you, Dr. Jager. It's wonderful to be here with you today, folks, on this beautiful, beautiful fall day. You know, as provost of this university, I'm often asked uh, about my views on the future of our state. What does it look like? What could it look like? And what are the challenges? Well, we can all go in a lot of directions uh, to answer that one, but there is one thing for sure. The future of North Carolina is about much more than the future of the Triangle, the Triad, and the Greater Charlotte area. The future of all North Carolinians concern all of our communities, rural and urban alike. If we want to strengthen these communities, equip every individual with the resources they need to succeed, and promote thriving, healthy economies across the state, we need to support our community colleges. That's why the work of the Belk Center is so significant and inspiring, and why the university is so grateful for the support and partnership of the John M. Belk Endowment. Here at NC State, we're continually motivated by our mission to think and do, to put innovative ideas to work in the places where they matter most. Rallying around this mission, we believe, determines our future, and I can think of few leaders who better embody this mission than the team at the Belt Center. The Belt Center plays an integral role in building strong, resilient communities across the state and beyond. They do this by convening leaders, creating tools, catalyzing social and economic mobility for learners. Like the Belt Center, NC State strongly values our role in the state's community colleges and how they play a critical role in educating our students and impacting our communities. To that end, we want to do everything we can do to make sure the community college students who desire to finish their education at NC State receive all the resources and support they need. 
Our community college collaboration program, which we call C3, we're not very innovative sometimes, aims to increase enrollment and bachelor's degree completion among low to moderate income, rural, under-resourced, military-affiliated, and first-generation transfer students. Through partnerships with community colleges, we work together to ensure access and success across the transfer lifespan. We also recognize that there are often financial burdens facing students who seek an NC State education. And to that end, we are grateful for the generosity and support from individuals like Jim and Ann Goodnight, who created the Goodnight Transfer Scholars Program, which provides full tuition to awardees as well as an ongoing program to develop mentorship and leadership uh, in STEM and STEM education fields. The program currently supports 121 transfer students at NC State, and next year will grow to 150 transfer students. Since launching in 2017, the Goodner Transfer Scholars Program has supported transfers coming to us from 36 of the 58 community colleges in the state. I know that uh, Anne Goodnight is with us virtually. So Anne, please let me take this opportunity to thank you for all of your support of education in our state and this particular investment in North Carolina transfer students. I'd also like to thank everyone gathered here today and everyone watching online for your dedication, leadership, and service on behalf of community colleges throughout North Carolina and across our country. Because of you, I believe our communities and students are better equipped to meet the challenges of today and tomorrow. For this reason, NC State is proud to host their annual Dallas Herring Lecture. We believe that having this dedicated time and space to gather education leaders and advocates together and to spend time addressing complex issues in education will have a deep, far-reaching and long-lasting impact on student success, economic vitality, and community well-being. So today we're very, very fortunate to hear from Dr. Felicia Williams, who is the ninth president of Prince George's Community College. She is a true servant leader, and Dr. Williams believes not only in guiding her faculty and staff, but in serving, supporting, and inspiring them as they invest in the next generation of leaders. With remarkable vision for the future, she has turned extraordinary challenges into extraordinary opportunities for Prince George's Community College and invites us to do the same in our sphere of influence. She brings more than 25 years of experience in community college leadership to the table. Prior to joining Prince George's Community College, she served as president for Valencia College's downtown and west campus. Today, Dr. Williams will share with us how we can change to position our colleges, our students for success in the future. Speaking from her own experience leading Prince George's through the complex waters of the pandemic, Dr. Williams will help us consider how to enrich learning environments, advance equity, and foster long-lasting transformations at our institution. Dr. Williams, thank you so much for being with us today. Please come to the podium. Thank you. Good afternoon. You are indeed my esteemed colleagues, friends, and I am truly honored to join you today and from the perch of my experience, I also just want to welcome you to this significant gathering where we explore the profound impact of a constant force that always impacts our lives, change. Whether planned or unexpected, change has the ability to shape our personal and collective journeys revealing the courage of our convictions and the true impact of our actions. In the face of challenges confronting community colleges, 
I see this moment as an opportunity for innovation. Rather than merely seeking stability or clinging to the past, we have a unique chance to guide our institutions toward increased viability and vitality. As we navigate the evolving landscape of leadership in community colleges, we stand on the brink of remarkable transformation, requiring our unwavering attention and a response characterized by boldness, balance, and poise. Since 2015, the Dallas Herring Lecture Series has provided valuable insights from esteemed higher education leaders. Today, I stand before you as the ninth speaker in this series, following in the footsteps of other tremendous higher education practitioners, such as Dr. Karen Stout, Dr. Pam Edinger, and Chancellor Mike Flores, who shared a deep belief in the power of education to drive access, success, and mobility. It is a tremendous honor to contribute to this legacy that uplifts communities through higher education in a state that is already rich with academic institutions. I strongly believe that our journey at Prince George's Community College, the impactful changes we have initiated, and our vision for an extraordinary future align with the best practices and aspirations of community colleges nationwide. As Dallas Herring emphasized in his letter to Dr. H.L. Trigg on December 10, 1957, it is not enough simply to survive. We must keep public education responsive to our traditions and the changing times, a challenging task. I challenge you, everyone in the room today, as well as those who are viewing virtually, to reflect upon this moment and this time. Within your institutions, within your circles of influence, so that you might consider what is your responsibility to steer the course of your institution towards extraordinary outcomes. Thank you for choosing to participate in this crucial conversation. Together, we contribute to the vibrancy of our democracy and to impact the lives of America's most valuable assets, our diverse human race. Let me take you on a bit of a journey that shaped my perspective on leadership and purpose. I grew up in the citrus belt of Florida where college was not the norm, and I say it's still not the norm for people of color, particularly persons who are black. I faced material poverty, but was extremely enriched in spirit and culture. My mother was blind, my grandmother was one who worked at the hospital, but they were both equally amazing and remarkable. They had a very strong work ethic, a selflessness that has influenced me profoundly in my own work. My mother's resilience working throughout her life despite what some would consider to be physical limitations, and my grandmother's dedication as a custodian at the local hospital were my early lessons around a work ethic. They also taught me about integrity and compassionate care. Despite financial constraints, they prioritized the education for me and my siblings, emphasizing its transformative power. After graduating, from one of the most prestigious liberal arts institutions in the Southeast. As a first generation college student, life took a bit of a detour as my grandmother became seriously ill. I postponed graduate school so that I could go back home to be able to help take care of my family. Facing the challenges in a community that had already overlooked my qualifications and frankly didn't expect much. I went back to the job that I'd had in high school, working at Winn-Dixie. It was there that I encountered a number of my former teachers and administrators. It led me to eventually accepting a job teaching at my alma mater. Living and working in my hometown highlighted the pivotal role of education. It was there that I saw that those who had earned a high school degree and those who had not were experiencing the same quality of life. 
The real differentiator was the college degree. The real differentiator for breaking generational stereotypes, for changing the trajectory of life, I was witnessing was one that was deeply grounded in the transformative power of education. As I witnessed the stark differences in opportunities based upon education, I knew it was also time for me to transition. Though I had enjoyed a tremendous career in K-12 education, the differentiator was higher education. And I was driven by this desire to see not only me, one who was a member of a posse, perhaps considered the 1%, but everyone in my community had the opportunity to see tremendous growth. I was driven by the desire for them to experience the type of intellectual and societal change that had been awakened deep in my own spirit. My journey crystallized the belief instilled by my mother and my grandmother. They had always said that a good education would make a difference because it would open doors. This realization led me into the post-secondary education sector, fueled by the vision for providing everyone with an authentic opportunity to dare to be extraordinary. Ladies and gentlemen, I am absolutely thrilled to stand before you as the ninth president of Prince George's Community College. Our institution is nestled in Prince George's County, Maryland, right on the eastern edge of Washington, D.C. It holds a unique position in a county that spans 499 square miles with nearly a million residents. What sets us apart is the rich tapestry of urban, suburban, and rural communities, all in very close proximity. Established in 1958, our college holds a significant place in history as it is the first educational institution in Prince George's County to integrate under the national desegregation laws. While we have evolved over the years, the last 35 years have seen us transform into a predominantly black institution, mirroring the development and the evolution of Prince George's County into the largest and second most affluent majority African-American county in the United States. Today, we proudly bear the federal designations of a minority-serving institution, a predominantly black institution, and we are an emerging Hispanic-serving institution. Of nearly 25,000 students, 96% are students of color. 47% identify as first generation. 66% receive some form of financial aid, of which 29% receive a Pell Grant. We embody diversity and inclusion. As the leader of this phenomenal institution since August of 2020, amidst the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, I have witnessed and experienced both the resilience and the ambition that define our institution. In these unprecedented times, we faced a myriad of challenges that were certainly familiar to you here in North Carolina. Declining appropriations, enrollment losses, disruption to in-person instruction, and a devastatingly impacted workforce. The pandemic forced a shift from face-to-face -face teaching to remote instruction, affecting not only our educational mission, but also the well-being of our community. Yet, despite the difficulties, our community rallied. We embraced remote instruction, hybrid operations, and virtual events. However, the challenges also triggered a range of emotions, pride in our ability to adapt, but also challenges with morale due to the isolation, the digital struggles, the loss of family members, the loss of colleagues, and the broader societal unrest, particularly related to race relations. Upon assuming my role, I recognize the importance of unlearning. 
to lead effectively, I had to shed preconceptions from prior experiences and understand the unique needs of the institution I was serving and the context of the environment. Unlearning, a transformative process, compelled me to evaluate systems and processes critically, ensuring lasting change. As we navigated these complexities, I encourage you to think in the same way and to ask the same questions that I asked then. What worked? What didn't work? What do we need to renew? What do we need to let go of? How can we indeed build better, a more lasting change? Unlearning is the key to deconstructing and reconstructing. And it empowers us to make revolutionary changes leading to extraordinary results. Together, we do have the power to shape the future of our illustrious institutions. Today, we find ourselves at a critical juncture, grappling with a profound question. Did the COVID-19 pandemic act as a catastrophe or a catalyst for change? This question weighs heavily, particularly in higher education, where community colleges stand at the heart of this dilemma. The world watches, contemplating whether we, as educators, will seize the moment to learn, proactively adapt, wildly reimagine, and create new paradigms aligned with our mission? Or do we risk becoming relics, overshadowed by systems embracing technological advancement, cultural competencies, flexibility, and personalized learning? While we wait, the full impact of the pandemic on education and employment outcomes are before us. One thing is clear, enrollment has been significantly affected. Community colleges were already experiencing gradual declines for nearly a decade, and now we face challenges from shifts in our demographics. We face a robust market. We face heightened competition from online and four-year institutions. We face a very unpredictable job market. This impact extends beyond state borders. Even here in North Carolina, enrollment witnessed a significant drop with a 13% reduction in faculty and staff over the past two years, strained resources and human capital. There's a slight uptick that you're experiencing, we're experiencing the same. But the levels from 2019 remain elusive and it yet to be determined whether they are indeed attainable. We also struggle with the declines in our black and Latino men having been more acute and their return much slower. The aftermath of COVID-19 presents other challenges to higher education, including the surge in remote learning and virtual employment, the digital divide, the incongruence between human capital needs and capacity, questions prevail regarding the value of higher education. Community colleges must navigate an unprecedented transition. And despite these challenges, it falls upon us as the leaders and the practitioners to declare that the pandemic was more of a catalyst for transformation than a harbinger of our downfall. We must respond with thoughtful, strategic and innovative frameworks, models, and operational practices that position us for remarkable change and progress. As leaders of community colleges, it is crucial to break free from conventional thinking and set bold objectives. Reflect on these questions. What would it take to significantly enhance or improve student success outcomes at your institution. Imagine achieving these results at a fraction of the current cost. Envision offering students 
a tenfold improvement in convenience, efficiency, or cost effectiveness. While these goals may seem daunting, global futurist Jack Aldridge urges us to unconstrain our thoughts and set unreasonable goals. The future, he says, is malleable, and we have the power to shape it. To succeed, let's embrace the extraordinary, explore the inconceivable, value unconventional wisdom, and challenge the established norms. My colleagues and my friends, we gather today to reflect on the audacity of leadership in the midst of adversity, especially in the wake of COVID-19. Yes, we could just sail to a new horizon that looks like where we are, or we can choose to disrupt our own tendency to try to return to what it is that we know. True leadership, as we've experienced at Prince George's during these trying times, surpasses stability. It is a collective effort to dare to be extraordinary. Our journey through the pandemic underscored the power and responsibility that we hold to grow and progress, even in the most tumultuous times. Instead of accepting a new normal, we found ourselves at a crossroads where the familiar past had vanished. It was crucial to view the disruption not as a disaster, but as divine order, as an opportunity that propels us to become a more vital asset for our communities. Yet amidst our substantial accolades, a pressing issue emerged despite our community connections. Our student success measures were dismal, ranking us at the bottom third for retention, progression, and completion among Maryland community colleges. Our graduation rate fell below accreditation thresholds, revealing a gap in equity and student success in our institutional narrative. Yet, it was so very important for us to take that look in the mirror. We could not believe our own press. Instead, we had to let the data tell a story even when it wasn't a delightful story. Initiative fatigue, cycles of improvement, racial stereotyping had cast a shadow on our commitment to student success. However, recognizing the need for change and inspired by John Cotter's principles in leading change, we pivoted institutionally. We created that sense of urgency we rallied to get the 75% of our leadership to embrace a compelling vision for the future. Celebrating achievements, we emphasized the need for shared goals, collaboration, renewed scholarship, professional development, and frankly, setting higher standards. Shifting focus, we envisioned promising outcomes, expanded our definition of success, and engaged in open dialogue about higher education state and our role. Urgency stemmed not from deficit thinking, but from exploring our institutional and community assets and amplifying our qualifications to meet local needs. We held fast to the belief that quantitative and qualitative data, perspectives and perceptions were invaluable to us as we prepared to focus on achieving these extraordinary outcomes. We sought and obtained the diverse feedback from internal and external audiences. Sometimes the insights felt like a kick in the shin. Sometimes it felt like someone was stepping on our toes. Yet, we trusted that the authenticity of the process and the integrity of the people involved in the process were extremely crucial because we believed honest and accurate feedback was absolutely necessary and we embraced it wholeheartedly. We conducted surveys, focus groups, and analyses. We 
commissioned researchers. We reviewed plans, scholarly literature. We drew on our prior experience with educational initiatives such as the Learning Center Initiative, the Bellwether College Consortium, the AACC Pathways Project, and Achieving the Dream. The resulting data led us to envision a new path to excellence, one that would require, however, significant changes in our mindset, our frameworks, models, practices, and even our organizational structure. It was a holistic proposition that dared us to see beyond what we had ever previously attained. We were thrilled in this time frame to witness the college community unite around the key elements of a vision. Following this, we directed our efforts toward crafting a plan for the realization of these extraordinary outcomes. As Peter Drucker wisely noted, or at least it's attributed to him, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Regardless of the strength of vision and planning, success hinges on a shared organizational culture. Thus, we must either endorse or reshape our beliefs and values to foster the innovation that we desire. Effective change requires robust leadership and support across the entity. Yet, this is just the beginning. To navigate change successfully, a coalition of influential individuals is essential. They must draw power from diverse sources, work cohesively, maintain urgency, and underscore constantly the need for change. Armed with the insights and formidable change coalition, we embarked on a shaping exercise to get to a new vision and a strategic direction. Even amidst a crisis such as COVID-19, I firmly advocate that organizations must not only address disruptions, but also prepare for the future. The period of change allowed us to introduce conditions that maximize impact, leading to aspirations focused on equity and excellence. We redirected attention solely to our student outcomes, promoting new models for collaboration and emphasizing innovative operational practices. Building on these themes, we initiated a cultural reset by redefining our vision, our mission, and our core commitments. Our vision is to be the region's premier center for teaching, learning, and community engagement, advancing knowledge, equity, and personal development. The mission centers on measurable progress for students in personal development, professional advancement, and economic prosperity. Our core commitments, students first, achievement, continuous improvement, empathy, equity, and integrity guide our actions and define our community mindset. These commitments will soon be complemented by behavioral indicators, becoming the core skills in our shared employee curriculum. This way, we will assess them akin to how we measure students' thoughts, knowledge, and actions. Today, I'm excited to share with you the essence of our ongoing innovation encapsulated in just a few examples from our strategic plan that boldly carries the name Dare to be Extraordinary. This title serves as an inspiration, urging us to reimagine our practices and the potential for what can result. It prompts us to answer the question, what if we approach our work with ingenuity, innovation, fortitude, and sustained focus? What would we be able to realize? Our first goal revolves around equitable access to Prince George's. With a focus on making our credentials, certificates, and degrees economically valuable and accessible to all the residents in our county. Unfortunately, our students like yours face challenges in reaching their academic and career goals due to limited access to necessary courses and services. To address this, we have redefined accessibility, focusing not just on physical proximity, but also on economic productivity of the available credentials, 
as well as the sensibility of navigating our institutional systems and environments for as many people as possible. To achieve this, we're adopting a synchronized service model, closing standalone extension centers, and introducing three comprehensive physical campuses, a virtual campus and a regional higher education center. Picture our future with a northern, a central, and a southern campus, each fully offering a set of degree programs, workforce programs, and innovation hubs of value that lead to high wage jobs and transfer to baccalaureate degrees. Imagine a virtual campus with online options, deploying traditional and self-directed competency-based learning modules for adults. Visualize a regional higher education center where Prince George's collaborates in a two plus two fashion with local universities to drive completion beyond the associate degree to the bachelor's degree. The new campus distri distribution model has three key objectives. First, it aims to enhance accessibility to educational achievement, job opportunity, and lifelong learning. Second, it provides pathways for expanded education, better paying jobs, home ownership, and partnerships with workforce development. Third, it serves as a beacon of opportunity in the region, contributing to professional services, talent growth, and economic investment. Our vision for goal two is centered on student success by optimizing pathways for students to graduate and transfer into the workforce and entering, earning a family sustaining wage. Despite the progress earned by developing guided pathways, still too many students, especially students of color, lack clear academic plans. They're enrolled but not making sufficient progress. Remember, 47% of our students are first generation, making them more likely to drop out without strong guidance and wraparound support. To address these challenges faced by students like Melinda, we've adopted an appreciative advising case management model and an advising curriculum aimed at enhancing student retention, progression, completion, and post-completion success. The student-centered approach involves six phases, disarm, discover, dream, design, deliver, and don't settle, coupled with definitive milestones for engagement and achievement. Goal three reflects our commitment to enhancing learning and achievement through impactful practices. We aim to create the optimal conditions and environments for student success. A deeply held big idea I bring with me from Valencia College is anyone can learn anything under the right conditions. Achieving the right conditions requires significant investment in people, infrastructure, and program design. The introduction of a teaching and learning center and instructional certifications for faculty reflect our dedication to supporting faculty in optimizing learning environments and programmatic offerings. By the spring of 2024, 100% of our faculty who teach online or hybrid courses will be certified. I'm aware that North Carolina's teaching and learning hubs are having tremendous success as well, where in two years, over 1,000 instructors have positively impacted more than 70,000 students. Finally, goal four focuses on increasing workforce innovation and strategic partnerships to position Prince George's Community College as a dynamic partner for economic mobility. We envision every student exiting with a credential, certificate, or degree will be well prepared for the workforce. With an emphasis on 21st century skills integrated into every program, we have worked with industry partners to design micro pathways as entry level ramps to employment that are also scaffolded within associate degrees that then lead to transfer baccalaureate degrees. The value proposition of employment is realized through strategically negotiated arrangements for aligned companies to hire completers who wish to immediately start a career. 
Conclusion, our push for innovation is about new ideas, new methodologies, with an essential and personalized focus on growth and achieving measurable gains. As we dare to be extraordinary, we must continue to strive for excellence. We must continue to pursue things even if we've never done them. At this time in our lives, not only do leaders need audacity to inspire progress, but we must also establish unconstrained and unreasonable standards to gauge the impact of the change. As Aldrich emphasized, you can't incrementalize yourself or your company into the future. To dare to be extraordinary, you're going to need to move beyond just gradual progress. Courage requires us to move at a pace that is rapid, to advance our student success outcomes, turning to the data, identifying significant outcomes aligned with our new vision and mission led us to establish what we consider to be radical key imperatives and outcomes. You can see them here, 50%, post-secondary participation rate for all of our high schools in our service area, 60% graduation rate within three years, 70% graduation rate within four years, 30% of graduates earning a bachelor's degree across six, 50,000 workers have a value credential, 1,000 full tuition scholarships beyond federal financial aid. For us, at Prince George's Community College, this is extraordinary because this is a double or better lift in our work. These measures are challenging to think, but we are determined not to constrain our thinking. We're determined to dare to do that which seems unreasonable, but we believe is absolutely attainable. Remember, the dare to be extraordinary is as much about people, our human capital, as it is about the outcomes they facilitate. Organizations exploring post-COVID future of work will need to tailor their approach to their unique context. In North Carolina, where 80% of the counties are rural, the future of work will require access to affordable broadband, transportation support, and other forms of flexible assistance, as well as increased skill development for workers. Balancing these three symbiotic elements, the nature of work and the workforce of the future and the workplace of the future can provide a holistic understanding of the forces now shaping community colleges and how we will need to shift. First, organizations need to answer two critical questions. How do you achieve your mission? And what methods do you use to accomplish your work? Second, the most valuable asset for any organization is its people. Preparing for the future means understanding your current workforce, supply and demand, the people that you have and the people that you will need. Third, the workplace includes both the physical location and its norms and practices, but also we become very familiar that our workplace is also virtual. Our work may be centralized, but we are in a time where the need for high degrees of flexibility, remote and hybrid models are becoming increasingly prevalent. At Prince George's Community College, we consider the imagined possibilities of the future to be the present probabilities. Therefore, we believe that radical provisions will contribute to optimal work environments, learning environments, and tremendous satisfaction and success for students and employees. Let me share a specific example at Prince George's where we're achieving extraordinary results involved in reconfiguring our senior team. While creating the college's new vision, mission and core commitments, we realized at the end that our senior level executive positions were no longer aligned to our most critical work. We created three new vice presidencies, redistributed the aligned oversight areas, renamed areas completely to better reflect the language of our foundational agreements. 
Another example of our innovative response to the future of work is our refreshed thinking about the workplace that has led to adopting alternative work schedules. That is, telework, compressed work weeks, and adjusted core work schedules based upon employee roles and responsibility. This is aimed to foster convenience, flexibility, and stronger collaboration while driving innovation and employee and student satisfaction. This restructuring was a crucial step towards executing the college's mission, vision, core commitments, and strategic plan. The signs are all around us. Prince George's Community College is already experiencing positive outcomes. We've seen quantifiable results in terms of our budget-saving efforts, including cost reductions and improved financial stability. We were able to forego a furlough altogether and offer every person who had been laid off during the pandemic their job back within 12 months. We did this while also offering a modest salary improvement each year. In examining our student success data, we see early signs of recovery in leading indicators such as progression, where a 4% increase in the three-year graduation rate for FY22 has already been experienced. And we have already submitted our preliminary data for, F, uh, for academic year 23, and it is showing an 8% increase. We've already experienced a 71% growth in the completion of certificates and degrees in the time period of the pandemic alone. Our survey data reveal that we are experiencing increased staff satisfaction and engagement via our alternative work schedules. We're pleased to be moving in a positive direction. And we recognize it will require a sustained focus on these strategies in order to obtain our Vision 2030 imperatives. From the beginning, I challenge you to reflect upon this moment at your own institutions, to consider how you, presidents, vice presidents, directors, how you would chart the course towards extraordinary. How do you define extraordinary in your context? Which metrics at your institution are no longer good enough? In what ways can you reimagine the structure and the operations of your college to better serve your students and your employees? How will you know you're making progress? I submit we're all at a fork in the road and we have choices to make. We can choose to continue in what we already know that's already familiar, or we can choose to pursue the extraordinary. Today, your presence and participation are both inspirational and humbling. Dallas Herring stated, it's simply gratifying to see that you desire to, that you desire to have to be of some service, to influence the course of the human event. In the tapestry of American education, community colleges are vibrant and vital threads that weave the dreams of countless individuals into the very fabric of our nation. Where else can you sit people who are politically opposed, who are racially divided, in rooms where they aspire to achieve the same great outcomes. Our community colleges are without a doubt the lifeblood of America, offering an unparalleled opportunity to grasp the American dream through education. Our institutions serve as stepping stones to successful, li to successful living, bridging the gap between ambition and achievement. They empower students to forge their path, whether to lead them to the broader workforce or back to service in their communities. What's truly extraordinary is that community colleges nurture diverse students who become leaders in our country and the global community and who stand as a testament to the strength of our ideals made real. In a world ever more interconnected and diverse, our institutions serve as incubators of talent and champions for inclusion. Our missions mirror the very essence upon which our nation was founded, the promise of opportunity, 
equality, and the pursuit of happiness. And within the halls of community colleges, we find our first generation college graduates whose stories like mine, and I'm sure some of you, exemplify the transformative power of these institutions. Why does it matter? Because like me, I believe, you believe every student matters. Like me, I believe, you believe, we can't afford to lose any of our students. Like me, I believe, you believe, if we know what to do that will realize a better outcome, we have a responsibility to do it. It is in the faces of my students that I look and recognize there are so many stories that are untold. It is in the faces of my students that I see the future and recognize that my work is inextricably tied to their achievements and their accomplishments. We must recognize they are our why. It's worth the risk. It demands our courage. And we must choose this time to respond. We must also remember Dallas Herring, the visionary who not only understood, but passionately championed the why behind community colleges. His legacy lives on through the countless lives touched and those that have been transformed. As we think about him, I encourage you to think about what will be your legacy. What are the lives you want to touch? What are the processes, the systems, the programs, the services that will cause you to push the boundaries of what you know in order to get better outcomes? So as I conclude, let us recognize that community colleges are not just educational institutions. They are indeed cornerstones of hope. They are pathways to success and the true embodiment in this country of what it means to dare to be extraordinary. Thank you very much. Across our great state, new programs and initiatives are propelling us forward in new and innovative ways. North Carolina's great 58 community colleges are accessible to all North Carolinians while balancing innovative workforce and community needs. At Haywood Community College, their community has seen more changes in a year than most have in a century. With its paper mill closing earlier this year and putting more than a thousand employees who had spent their entire careers working there suddenly out of work, Haywood Community College immediately stepped in to help those workers shift gears. Students who hadn't been in a classroom in decades, who are already graduating in new fields, allowing those workers to stay in their community with new jobs to take them into their next careers. In Raleigh, Wake Tech's motto is to lead the way. And for their students, the sky is truly the limit. Wake Tech recently joined forces with Elizabeth City State University, one of North Carolina's public HBCUs and the only university in the state offering an aviation education program. Setting students on the elite path to fill local demands for drones and unmanned aircraft system operators with local emergency management and fire services divisions, which means more future job opportunities and workers to fill them. As our world changes, it's up to our communities to adapt. At Durham Tech, the adaptation is also well underway with a newly expanded automotive program to fill the growing demand for electric vehicle technicians to set their students and their local communities up for success as we head into the next generation of technology. And they're helping the next generation get a head start before walking across the high school graduation stage by partnering with Durham Public Schools to provide free college classes to local high school students, laying the groundwork for holistic success. 
150 miles to the southeast, Cape Fear Community College's mission is to provide the southeast coast with accessible quality education and world-class workforce training. That's what they've been doing for more than six decades by enhancing the regional economy and supporting a skilled workforce for local employers along the way. Now they're pushing the limits even further as they work to more than triple the number of nursing graduates to fill local workforce needs. And to eliminate childcare barriers so many students face, they've launched free drop-in childcare program for students, setting the stage for entire families to see generational change. At Roanoke Shawin Community College, they believe strong connections lead to success. Recently connecting with North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University, another public HBCU, to create opportunities for students with transferable skills in both the manufacturing and renewable energy industries through a new clean energy pre-apprenticeship program and leveraging its strong connection motto to partner with energy giants Dominion Power and Inviva who specialize in renewable energy alternatives to coal to connect students to practical experience to prepare them for the jobs ahead. These five colleges give us just a snapshot of the transformative impact the North Carolina community colleges have on our communities and economy. Across every region of our diverse state, our great 58 colleges are fostering countless opportunities while shaping learners of all ages for the jobs of tomorrow serving as beacons of change and empowerment to the students and communities we serve. All right, good afternoon everyone. I'm Paola Stein, I'm Dean of the College of Education and I wanna thank uh, Dr. William for this amazing presentation that together with our video reminds us of the importance of community college for moving our nation forward. Um, you have shared so many wonderful and practical insights with us, so for that, I'm very thankful. I know the example of shooting for the moon and reimagining what can, we can achieve amidst change will stick with all of us and will both inspire and inform our collective efforts moving forward. Thank you. I also took your remarks to heart. Uh, our own College of Education here at NC State has just launched a new strategic plan with a re revised mission statement and vision statement and new four strategic fo focus areas through which we plan to work to solve some of the biggest educational problems of our times and enhance our collective impact. One of our first initiatives working with the Belk Center for Community College Leadership and Research is to enhance our partnership with Community College and deepen our reach across North Carolina. We cannot have the impact we want to have in our state without this partnership. I would like now to introduce our two respondents uh, for today, Presidents J.B. Buxton and Shelley White, who will share examples of practice in North Carolina. So let me say a few words about them. J.B. Buxton is the fifth president of Durham Technical Community College and a former member of the North Carolina State Board of Education. He's the founder and principal of the Education Innovations Group, a consulting practice focused on improving public K-12 and post-secondary education and a longtime advocate of community colleges in North Carolina. He has given back to the state of North Carolina in several capacities, serving as Deputy State Superintendent of the Department of Public Instruction and as Senior Education Advisor to Governor Mike Easley. Nationally, he worked with the Domestic Policy, Policy Council as a White House Fellow under President Clinton. Today, he will share examples of practice to demonstrate the importance of evaluating our institution, especially as our communities shift and change, as we were just reminded of the many changes, in order to ensure our institutions are developing talenting, talent and impacting our communities in transformative ways. Dr. Shelley White is the seventh president of Haywood Community College and a longtime resident of Western North Carolina. A graduate of Isothermal Community College, Dr. White personally understands 
the needs of community college students, and is passionate about creating a brighter future for them. She earned a doctorate in education with a concentration in community college leadership from Western North Carolina University in 2023. And she was named Woman of the Year by the Haywood County Chamber of Commerce in her investment in the community. Today, she will share examples of practice to demonstrate why the response of our rural community colleges to emerging challenges is so significant for the success of our communities. Since the very beginning of our College of Education, we have known and we have been guided by a singular vision, ensuring that educational success of all learners across North Carolina and beyond. Because of this vision, we are proud to support the Belk Center and the annual Dallas Herring Lecture. And we are grateful for the work that President Buxton and White do to advance this vision every day. So with that, please join me in welcoming our first respondent, President J.B. Buxton. Good afternoon. Dean Stein, thank you for the warm introduction, although I notice you didn't mention I'm a Tar Heel. <laughs> but as an NC State dad, it's particularly good to be here. And even as a Tar Heel, it's good to be here, although I think that's because we haven't played you on the football field yet this year. Uh, as we get going here, I first want to thank Dr. Williams for sharing your personal story, the Prince George's story, and a powerful call to action. And, more on that in a moment. Uh, I want to thank in advance President Shelley White, my colleague. I've gotten a sneak peek at her remarks. You're in for a treat. And I want to thank you personally for your leadership and for the college's service to the people of Haywood County. Thank you. I want to thank A.J. Jager and her team for this invitation to the Belk Center and Provost Arden. I want to thank NC State for your investment in the Belk Center and by, by extension your investment in North Carolina's community colleges, your land grant leadership is critical to our state. Now, there are so many people in this room I could recognize, and it usually takes me about 10 minutes to tell a story. I only have 10 minutes. So uh, besides President Cox and our board chair, and I think I've done what I need to there, I want to recognize uh, my colleagues from Durham Technical Community College who are here, and my wife, Hunter, who's joining us today as well. Our state has one of the great mottos in this country, S.A. quam videri, to be rather than to seem. As an educator, I have always loved this motto because I felt that it speaks directly to our history in public education. After all, we were the first state in the union to launch the public university at the close of the 18th century. In the 1930s, we were the only state in the nation to keep our schoolhouse doors open throughout the Great Depression. Of course, in the 1960s, we built what, what would become one of the most comprehensive and impressive community college systems in the country. In the 1990s, we dared to be first in America in public education, and in the opening decades of the 21st century, we built the greatest system, statewide system, of early colleges in America. For North Carolinians, educational leadership and innovation is our birthright. Since 1793, we have prized being over seeming in the pursuit of educational excellence. As a North Carolinian, listening to Dr. Williams today, I hear an implicit call to assess how well our community colleges, in fact, live up to our state motto. She's provided a clear-eyed challenge to be not just agents of change, but continuous change institutions committed to a spirit of transformation and a willingness to set big goals and continually make course corrections, to dare to be extraordinary. In many ways, this is a role we have long known. We are, after all, the original transformation institution, the original equity institution, called upon in the 1960s to help a state transform from tobacco, textiles, and furniture call to create new opportunities no matter your educational background or birthright, and to build bridges to K-12 and universities, workforce and community organizations, 
agencies, and employers. We are the institution committed to talent development, not talent identification. We take pride, to quote our colleague, President Scott Rawls, not in the SATs or GPAs of our incoming classes, but in the openness of our doors. And to paraphrase Dr. Herring, in our ability to support people as far as they want to go. As community colleges, we are celebrated for our connectivity, our nimbleness, and our impact we can have on people from all walks of life. The twinned nature of our ability to shift to address the needs of our students and employers and our firm anchor in our local communities is the double helix of our genetic makeup that creates impact. It is our historical DNA. But that is the story of where we have been. The challenge I hear Dr. Williams leveling today is to commit to continually ask ourselves whether we are living up to this genetic inheritance. To make an unbiased and unabashed commitment to interrogate the mythology of our impact. And in doing so, identify where we measure up and where we don't. To be rather than to seem. Dr. Williams has provided us with the decisions she and Prince George's are making and where they focus, the goals they set, the values they hold, and how they're organized and structured to drive impact. For North Carolina's urban colleges, each of whom is experiencing significant shifts in demographics, industries, the nature of work itself, what is our version of that Prince George's story? We, su we serve student bodies that are diverse and diversifying. We have dozens of languages and universities in our backyard. Companies like Apple, Toyota, Wolfspeed, Boom and GE Aerospace, ABB, Nova Nordisk, our statewide health systems are creating pathways to good jobs and new markets in areas like healthcare, life sciences, IT, advanced manufacturing, clean tech, EV batteries and logistics, and not just one or two of these in our urban county backyards, but all of them. We are also at the top of a list you don't want to leave. Places with the least economic mobility and the largest wealth gaps. Given these realities and the choices at hand, where do we train our focus? How should we set a strategy to develop all our talent, drive urban economies that benefit the whole state, and deploy our institutions to solve local challenges? As much as I hate to do it to you, I want to suggest four questions to add to your questions as a kind of framework to assess how well positioned we are for ongoing transformation, ongoing impact, ongoing daring to be extraordinary, a kind of compass to help us determine direction. The first question, do we find the community in our colleges? We often ask ourselves and look at our data about how well our student body reflects our communities, and rightly so. Equally important, do our faculty and staff and administrators? What perspectives do our campus leaders bring? At Durham Tech, when we looked at our performance gaps, we began to focus on recruiting and growing more people of color into our leadership roles, and specifically men of color. Because the lived experience and perspectives of your leadership team makes a major impact on the focus of your change agenda. Second, do we inspect what our communities expect? We are expected to be gateways to great universities, pathways to prosperous careers, institutions with local impact. Do we as colleges inspect transparently our progress towards those ambitions? When we looked at our data, we were not satisfied by the median wage of individuals who enrolled at Durham Tech 10 years ago. We are not satisfied by the percentage of individuals not earning more than a high school graduate or moving up the wage ladder. That led us to two major goals, a specific completion goal, 60%, and a job outcome so that a percentage, 80%, are getting jobs with at least median wages in field. We want to assure that Durham Tech not only helps you cross the finish line, but helps you enter careers that bring stability, mo mobility, stability, try that again, mobility, and build generational wealth. And we want to use those success measures to anchor the choices that we make about people, programs, 
and partners. Third, where do we need to make more of an impact? The reality of urban North Carolina colleges is that we have the luxury to decide which pathways and jobs we want to focus on. A luxury that calls on us to ask some tough questions. Do our programs lead to livable wages? Do careers, and do they lead to careers where our graduates can grow? Do they lead to transfer success? Over the last few years at Durham Tech, we've closed seven degree programs and 30 plus certificates because they didn't align with projected demand or led to less than livable wages. And we created rooms to create new ones or scale existing ones that meet those tests. What we haven't take up, taken up, but know we must, is addressing how well aligned our enrollment, which we are equally working equally hard to grow, and the enrollment of subgroups within our institution is aligned with the high value pathways in our backyards. Think STEM, baccalaureate transfer, technicians. Are we advising and positioning everyone for opportunity and options? As one example, thanks to our county commissioners in Durham, life sciences partner Nova Nordisk and the nonprofit Made in Durham, we're not just making a big bet on life sciences, we are making big investments in ensuring widespread access to all the talent in our community to this sector. Fourth and finally, where are our peer colleges indispensable to our own success? At Durham Tech, I can throw a rock and hit Wake Tech, Piedmont, Vance Granville, Alamance, Johnston, Central Carolina. Lisa Chapman, don't you come too near that Orange County line. <laughs> but in a labor market where companies are looking at 20 plus counties as their talent shed, students and employers could care less about the county line. We simply can't do our job without working with our peers to deliver results. Durham Tech and, and Wake Tech launched RTP Bio to pool resources and commit to a shared approach, not just on ISAs, but on community awareness, customized training, curriculum and faculty development, apprenticeships, program offerings, and student scholarships. Many of you in this room are delivering similar strategies. Rather than being end endangered by our neighboring colleges, where is our success enhanced by and in fact dependent upon them? And how do we make this the rule, not the exception? Our students work hard to us, stay with us, finish with us. They may not walk 130 miles like Hinton James did to become the first post-secondary student in North Carolina, but they manage jobs, families, personal hardships and challenges to join us to persist at our colleges with the goal of being able to have more, to do more, to be more. Our cities and counties look to us to deliver talent, attract and grow companies, and step in on key local quality of life priorities. The four suggestions, the four questions I've suggested that we continually ask ourselves. Is our community truly reflected in our college? Do we inspect what our communities expect? Where do we need to make even greater impact? And where are our peers indispensable to our success are meant to inspire introspection, not proclaim prescriptions. They are intended to answer Dr. Williams' call to lead with courage and transformational power and to be equal to the determination of our students and the needs of our communities. It is our challenge to ensure that the romance of the community college is in fact the reality. Because in the end, after all the speechifying, what speaks last and loudest is not what we say we are, but what the success of our students and communities reveals us to be. And defines if we as North Carolina's community colleges are living into the institutional inheritance bequeathed to us as our community's colleges. S.A. Quam Federi. Thank you. Thank you, President Buxton. I'm honored to share the stage with you as well as with Dr. Williams. Thank you for your challenge and for your remarks. And I'd like to thank Dr. Jager and your team for assistance with preparation for today's events. 
I'm excited to be with you today to share with you the importance of a rural community college response to this charge. My home is the rural mountain town of Canton in Haywood County, North Carolina. In comparison to Durham's population of over 285,000, Canton's residents number less than 5,000. Earlier this year, the paper mill that is at the center of town unexpectedly announced that it was closing permanently. Over a thousand jobs ended for a workforce that runs four generations and 115 years deep. I grew up in a mill village in Caroline in eastern Rutherford County, North Carolina. As a child, my sister and I, along with our friends, would ride our bikes up and down the checkerboard streets that made up our little town by all the mill houses that by this time had passed to the second or third generation. Our church, bank, and post office were all within walking distance of our house. My mom would call us in for supper by ringing the dinner bell out the kitchen door, the unmistakable sound that we better get home. That meal employed hundreds in the area throughout the years, including the parents and grandparents of many of our friends. Mealtown life was the center of the community. I was fortunate to be able to stay close to home for my first two years of college graduating from Isothermal Community College with an Associate of Science degree and transferring to earn my bachelor's. I earned an appreciation for the North Carolina Community College system at an early age. As a graduate student, I landed a position teaching part-time at AB Tech Community College in Asheville. And one of my earliest assignments was working with employees of companies announcing layoffs in the years ahead of the Great Recession. I saw the importance of this work in the eyes of those facing uncertainty and change. Today, the mill in the town where I grew up is closed, and the community that grew up around it is forever impacted by its presence and ultimately by its absence. So when the announcement was made in March about the Canton Mill closing, I reflected on my childhood and also on the hundreds of transitioning workers that I'd met years ago as I remembered their faces moving from despair to relief as new opportunities were presented to them. I knew that Haywood Community College was positioned to be a leader in the work to provide hope in the days, months, and years ahead. Through these experiences and our college's response, I want to share with you why I believe the rural response of our community colleges is so important. 47 of the 58 North Carolina community colleges serve rural communities, and this number grows to 260 community colleges when we look nationwide, according to the U.S. Department of Education. 260 of you look like me. The rural response is our ability to stand strong in times of economic crisis, to meet the needs of our citizens, despite unpredictable enrollment and funding challenges. The rural response of our community colleges must be immediate, powerful, and well-resourced for the continued success of our small communities and for the future of our state. The rural response must be immediate, the afternoon that we learned of the mill closure, shock waves literally rippled through the entire community. And within a few hours, the response effort was mobilizing. Our college response team convened the next morning, and by the end of the week, community leaders and officials from across party lines gathered on our campus, including local, regional, state, and federal partners who would band together for the work ahead. Haywood Community College aligned with partners on job fairs and community resource fairs. We participated in the initial rapid response meetings with employees. We deployed job seeking and computer access training at the local library. Within days, HCC Foundation announced a new scholarship, 
Haywood Strong with an initial investment of $56,000 to support mill workers, their families, and others impacted by the closing. Within a few weeks, HCC announced a slate of summer programs scheduled to start within weeks following the closure, including a new CDL truck driver training program in partnership with Caldwell Community College and Technical Institute. We saw former mill employees registering for truck driver training, machining, construction, public safety, and health care programs, and many others planning for curriculum programs starting this fall. Dr. Williams asked if sometimes we underestimate our potential. As small rural colleges, others may be even more likely to underestimate our potential, but I believe that we are anchors. Anchors for our communities in times of crisis and opportunity. Anchors providing strength and stability in times of change and uncertainty, yet able to move and adapt. We hold steady in the storm and navigate quickly to the people and places who need us most. The rural response is immediate. It's adaptable, flexible, because it's local. Our partners and those we are here to serve make up the fabric of our local communities. They are our friends and our neighbors. The rural response is also powerful. A thousand jobs, a thousand families, Thousands of people impacted across the region. I'll share with you the stories of a few of those individuals and the powerful impact of a continued ready response in our rural communities. As I mentioned, part of our response included informational meetings, job and resource fairs at various locations throughout our county. Ray, a 26-year employee of the mill, was at every event and he expressed to me in April that he was eager for the next chapter of his life to begin and wanted to get his CDL truck driver certification. Thanks to Haywood's partnership with Caldwell, less than 10 weeks later, Ray walked across the stage at HCC and earned his CDL certification and is already benefiting from these new career skills. Another former mill employee shared with me that his father was laid off due to a different plant closure in the late 1990s. Over 700 people lost their jobs at that time, and many turned to Haywood Community College for training, including his father, who gained a new career because of the community college experience. With a looming separation date and a heavy determination, he said to me, if my dad can do it, I know I can do it too. Two other employees, Marty and Justin, joined Haywood Community College as new team members this year and are bringing their years of experience to help others within our community. The response of Haywood Community College engaging with partners helped make these offers of hope possible for Ray and so many others. As we prepare to celebrate our 60th anniversary in 2025, we know the impact of our presence, of our continued response, has changed the lives of generations of citizens in our county and beyond. The rural response is powerful because when you improve future opportunities, income potential, career outlook, when you provide hope for one, you change the trajectory of an entire family, of an entire community. The rural response must be well-resourced. Our rural community colleges are leaders within our community. We are economic engines and workforce development powerhouses. We are also the hubs of our communities. Our campus not only serves as Haywood's College, educating first responders, nurses, early childhood teachers, foresters, construction workers, and many others, but we also provide a place for community resources and gathering. We operate a five-star early learning center hold frequent art exhibits from our professional crafts programs. We offer a popular disc golf course and expanded hiking trail throughout our beautiful campus. Every one of our rural colleges serve as an anchor institution for their communities, providing after school clubs, event venues, sports teams, recreation, and the list goes on. Small rural colleges must be well-equipped to remain ready to respond. 
How we are equipped today will determine our ability to respond tomorrow. Did I know during the years of the pandemic, as we navigated the challenges of simply operating and managing through declining enrollment and funding, that we would be faced with the largest single plant closure in our region's history? Of course not. But I knew that we needed to remain true to our mission and ready to respond. We worked throughout the years of the pandemic uncertainty to safeguard operations, programs, and facilities, and carved out resources for new technologies, innovative programs, and engagement activities. Despite the challenges faced through the pandemic, Haywood Community College was ready to respond. Our joint partnerships forged in the days following the mill closure led to significant levels of support for our initial and continued recovery efforts. Weekly crisis team meetings led to philanthropic support, including a full-time position at our college to support dislocated workers and unrestricted funds to bolster response activities. And these partnerships led to a joint legislative request, successfully resulting in over $60 million in support for countywide response efforts, including $6 million to Haywood Community College for investments in workforce education. A well-resourced response is critical in times of crisis. Our communities are counting on us to stand in the gap and offer an outstretched hand towards new opportunities. In closing, community colleges are the heart of our rural communities, and we are called to meet the changing needs of the community. We are called to be prepared for the best of times and in times of crisis. The rural response is critical for our future. Dr. Williams challenged us to dare to envision a future state that is counterintuitive to our present circumstances. As a community, we are focused on rising above the challenges of the present and the past three years, helping workers find jobs and connect with resources to continue navigating this time successfully. We are focused on the future economic health of our region, new jobs, and industry growth in Haywood County. We are all aiming for a brighter future. For nearly 60 years, Haywood Community College has been an anchor for thousands of students and their families. Nationally, the number of students educated at rural serving community colleges is 670,000 annually. Our collective rural response will continue to have a significant impact. At Haywood Community College, we aim to expand our workforce training center to equip continued generations of workers in our community and beyond. We aim to increase the number of career-focused high school pathways and of adult learners earning certifications, including truck driver training and many other opportunities leading to sustainable futures. In the same room where Haywood Community College hosted the press conference in March, just days following the announcement of the mill closure, and committed to creating short-term programs to support workers in transition, we welcomed students to the first truck driver training graduation in August. It was a celebration for graduates and their families, but also a celebration of the partnerships and resources at all levels to make these programs possible. As those dozen graduates stepped forward to receive their new credentials, their path to a new future, I was reminded, this is why we do what we do. This is why we work together for the benefit of our citizens and community. This is our rural response. Thank you. Presidents White and Buxton, you thank you so much for sharing your really impactful examples of practice. Your tenacity and devotion encourage us to put that practice into action with the things we've learned today. Though you serve very distinct contexts and face very different challenges in urban and rural settings, you have reminded us that if we take it seriously, our role to foster change in our communities 
then we also need to be agile, ready to respond, adapt, reevaluate in order to meet our students' needs. I would also like to extend a thank you to Dr. Willa Williams. Your passion for transformation, your willingness to push the boundaries of whatever is possible at Prince George's Community College and in the world of education is quite inspiring and captures the spirit of our very own Dallas Herring. To the Belk Endowment, thank you for your incredible generosity and unwavering support of the Belk Center and the North Carolina Community College system. In addition to resourcing initiatives, fostering partnerships, advancing research, and supporting student success, your fervor for the work and commitment to the strengthening communities across North Carolina is extraordinary. I would also like to thank NC State and Provost Arden for uplifting community colleges and transfer students, serving the underserved, and continually supporting the work of the Belk Center. Finally, I would like to thank my colleagues, Noemi Ramirez and Monique Cloclaw, for their tireless work in producing this event and making it meaningful for each of our attendees. They are joined by the brilliant Belk Center team to make this all happen, and I'd like to give them a round of applause. And now to conclude this event, you won't be surprised that I want to leave you with some final words from, thank you. <laughs> Reflecting on how education is one of the most rewarding yet challenging careers, Herring wrote, it is an exacting and demanding and challenging and time consuming duty, but it is certainly not without rewards. Every day, I am grateful I am grateful for the opportunity to work with leaders like each of you. This came as a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Who are committed to supporting Herring's own philosophy that our communities recognizing that every human being is of incomparable worth and we must develop a comprehensive educational system, one that brings each individual's talents to the fullest potential. And as Herring stated, the doors to higher education must never be closed to anyone. But there will be obstacles and barriers to achieving an educational system like this, and Herring was quite familiar with them. He once wrote, why do we give up so easily? Why are we satisfied to rest? We have only begun to educate ourselves we have barely scratched the surface of what is possible. We are not alone, nor have we ever been, to do the work that needs to be done. So let's not give up easily. Let's not rest until each individual's talents have reached their fullest potential. Thank you all for joining us in the 2023 Dallas Herring Lecture.